Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to take a survey of the Old and New Testaments, what a blessing it is to be able to look at uh, how scripture comes together as a whole. Pray that you would bless this time and that you would continue to open our minds to help us see the wonderful things in your word, that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds and help us understand. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome. Come on in. Uh, we have just under 200 years of history to cover this morning. It's been a while since I've been up here, um, several weeks. I've been looking forward to teaching today. Uh, my seminary work this semester has been pretty intensive for me, so I had to cut back um, on how much I was teaching here, so I was very sad about that, but um, I'm learning a lot. Um, I couldn't give this week up, though, because um, when I started seminary last fall, I took the New Testament survey class with Dr. Palmer. So I'm very excited about teaching from the class that I learned in, in the fall. Um, and this section of the time in the intertestamental period was the time that I was most excited about because it's the time that I learned the most that I'd never known before. Um, I had not really um, known much about the intertestamental period, so I was very interested in seeing how this um, opened up some new understanding for me about the, uh, the New Testament. Um, so I hope that you come away with a little bit of new information as well. So we've been going through um, the casket, and now we are in second week of Empty, the New Testament portion of our Bible survey class. Um, and the Bible is one redemptive story through history with Jesus at its center. Um, the casket portion we've finished, that was the 18 weeks in the Old Testament, and now we're going to be spending, I think it's 14 weeks in the New Testament, and our expectations portion is just these two weeks. So today we are going to be finishing up our E letter, um, which is for expectations. M is for Messiah, P is for Pentecost, T is for teaching, and Y is for yet to come. So today we continue with E, and this bumps right up to the time where Christ makes his earthly appearance. Uh, generally, within a narrative story, you have rising action that builds up to a climactic point. Um, in the Bible, we have seen lots of rising action to different climactic moments, and um, the expectation of a coming Messiah has been something that people have been looking forward to all the way back to Genesis 3 where uh, Eve was told, you know, you will have a child or your offspring will crush the head of the serpent. And she named her firstborn Cain. Um, With God's help, I have brought forth a man. And surely she thought, this is the one, this is the one who will uh, crush the head of the serpent. But as we know, uh, that was not uh, the one um, and how disappointing that is. But to see how these expectations have been built over time, um, we have been looking forward to this coming Messiah, and as we get to the intertestamental period, the expectations have grown to a fever pitch. If you have a timeline, um, if you don't have the Old Testament timeline, I'll take a look back at it. Um, we saw how the blue line traced the. Ooh, sorry. We saw how the blue line traced through the um, kings portion. And if you noticed on the timeline, there was a little bit of like a light blue line um, where the, uh, the hopes and the expectations were fading and in times when uh, those things were, it looked like all hope was lost. In our New Testament timeline, the line kind of goes right up through the exile where things looked very uh, sad and dashed hopes all that time. And then we'll see the Messiah comes. Uh, the blue, the uh, icon for this section is this blue crown. Um, the blue crown reminds us of the legitimate kings of Israel um, in Judah. 
and it uh, gives us the expectation of God's king and his coming kingdom. So if you think of rising action as in a movie, there's always a point, especially in action movies, where all hope seems lost. The music gets kind of sad sounding, and um, it looks like everybody's about to lose. Uh, you know what I mean? Then the big battles where, you know, Captain America is, he just looks done. He's, he's alone, nothing is going to happen, but then he hears, on your left, and out of the portal comes Black Panther and all the Avengers. Um, all hope is lost in the Lord of the Rings, but then the horn sounds and the riders of Rohan come over the hill and, or the eagles are coming, um, or in Star Wars when Han and Chewie come out for, with the Millennium Falcon and the tide has turned and Luke can blow this pop stand and get out of here. So all those were for you, Kat. <laughs> So this is the period of time when everything just, I mean, the, they've been in exile, they've come back, they have um, had a king, and then the kingdom was conquered. Um, they had held on to this hope for so long. They knew Messiah was coming, they just didn't know when or how long. Kind of like us, we know that Christ is coming back. Uh, we just don't know when or how long we will wait. So we can really identify with the people in this period as we wait for Christ's coming again. Uh, but hope deferred can make the heart sick and the people had to endure a lot of trials during this time. And how did they hold on to their hope? Um, they read the word, they held on to the scripture. Um, they had seen these things happening in, um, just like the prophets had said, you know, you will go into exile. But then the prophets also said, Messiah will be coming. Uh, and so they knew, since God had been faithful, that he would continue to be faithful. So they held on to their hope. Um, a lot of the things that they would have been looking at would have been the major prophets and Daniel. And I'm going to cover some um, history that we find in some of the apocryphal works. So the people turned to the prophets who said all these things would happen, but the Messiah would be coming. God used some of these things to build the expectations. So we remember um, last week we learned a little bit about the prophecy um, that da Daniel had in chapter 2 of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of the uh, four-parted statue. Uh, there was a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron mixed with clay. Um, and so this statue represented the different kingdoms that would rule over Judah. And then there was going to be a stone, of un, uh, un, an unhewn stone, that would come and smash the statue. So we have seen in our casket study how Babylon came in, um, how Persia came and conquered um, Babylon. Last week, we heard about how Greece came in. Um, this was the cycle of these kingdoms that were prophesied. The first two were in our uh, casket section of time, and last week, Eric covered the Greece, and today, I'm going to be covering a little bit of Rome. So before that, just a short recap of what happened. Um, in about 400... Um, 30 BC, um, Israel was part of the Greek world. After the Babylonian and Persian rule, uh, the Persians had been uh, defeated by Alexander the Great. And when Alexander died, his kingdom was broken up and Israel ended up in the middle of the conflict zone. So sometimes they were able to live by their own ways and sometimes they were um, treated much more like a, a part of the empire or state that was ruling over them. Sometimes they had some semi-independence where they would be able to do some of those things. One really amazing thing is when Ptolemy II came over and there, the Ptolemaic rule was over Israel. Ptolemy II loved uh, to uh, find more books and for the library in Alexandra and had sponsored the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. So that was a really amazing uh, project. We can see that even though God wasn't speaking through his prophets in that time, 
um, God was still working and still using people um, to work out his story. That really raised not only the expectations of the Hebrew speaking people, but also the Greek speaking people. Now they had access to the scriptures and they could see some of these prophecies um, coming. So Next, we saw how the Jews were conflicted over their attitude toward Greek culture. Some people were saying we should assimilate and we should be part of kind of the Greek culture and others wanted to strictly stay with the Jewish culture. Um, we saw in uh, how Antichius IV plundered the temple and uh, outlawed worship of God, killed many people, uh, called himself God Manifest. Uh, and they, however, many in uh, Israel stayed true to God's laws in spite of persecution. Um, a group of those were called the Maccabees, um, uh, led by um, Judas Maccabees and the Hasmonean family. And he led a revolt that enabled the Jewish people to retake control of Jerusalem. And that was in um, December 164 B.C., the temple was rededicated. And that is the celebration of Hanukkah that um, is still celebrated today. Um, so several in that time period from 164 for about 100 years, um, Judah is ruled by uh, Jewish people independently. So at that point, they are not giving a tribute to Greece or any other um, place. They are an independent uh, nation at that time. So these Hasmonean people, uh, this family, rules, and the idea is that they are ruling until the true prophet arises. They are waiting for the Messiah to come and inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth. Um, one really interesting, there's so much history during this time um, that it's just it's not possible to cover it. Even in my whole seminary class, we couldn't cover all the different people and all the different things in the time period. Um, but what our professor had us do was do a biographical sketch of one person. That allowed us to get really deep into finding out more and really gave us a lot of the, um, I don't know, some, we were reading primary sources and finding more intricate details of more than nitty gritty just on that person, which enabled me to have a better understanding of the time period as a whole. Um, and when we were doing our reading in um, the empty uh, study guide, I read about a pious Jewish queen. And I was like, who is this? I am very interested in this pious, pious Jewish queen during the Hasmonean dynasty. So allow me to introduce you to Salome, Salome Alexandra. Toward the end of the Hasmonean rule, that 100 year period, um, for about 27 years in the 90s to the 70s BC, a king named Alexander Janus was in power. Uh, Alexander and Salome had two sons, um, and during this time period, you'll see that the Sadducees were the people who were wanting to assimilate more with the Greek culture. They were following some of those things, and, and the Sadducees were more of an aristocratic ruling class um, of Jews. And the Pharisees were a group who had been loyal to God's word, who wanted to be faithful, and they actually were persecuted by people in power. So Alexander and uh, Salome um, had two sons, Salome and the oldest son, uh, how do I say his name, Her Hyrcanus, um, they were partial to the Pharisees. In fact, Alexander had um, persecuted some of these Pharisees, and Salome, there's evidence to show that she had hidden some of them away, protected them. Um, and uh, Alexander and Aristobulus were more partial to the Sadducees. So on his deathbed, Alexander leaves the kingdom to Salome, um, not to either of his sons. Uh, Salome keeps her husband's death a secret uh, for a couple of days uh, until their military had finished a siege so she could consolidate power. Uh, she brought out those Pharisees that she had protected, um, which ensured their loyalty. She imparted some power to them, enabled her to become the sole reigning monarch. So 
that was a successful transfer of power in some really tricky political dynamics. Um, and she began a reign of peace in her time. So Eric told us about some of the other Hasmonean rulers where the king would also be the high priest. So not only was he controlling the government, he was also controlling the um, the priestly duties and the religious power. Um, in this time, Salome appointed her oldest, her Ankenos, um, to be able to be the high priest, and she remained the monarch. So that uh, separated those powers more properly. Um, we, we know the role of ruler and high priest uh, would not be united until uh, Christ. And she appointed Aristobulus as a military commander. So during her nine year reign, Salome was considered a pious queen and she was beloved by the people. She studied the law and the Jewish customs. Uh, she restored some of the practices of the Pharisees. These were the people that wanted to follow God's laws. She was displeased by a lot of the crimes, the political crimes her husband had um, committed against uh, some of the Pharisees and she banished the people who were um, in cahoots with her husband um, and had transgressed God's laws during his reign. She was also a competent ruler. Uh, she doubled the size of the army. She procured foreign troops. Uh, the nation of Judah became strong and was feared by surrounding nations. Uh, she wisely didn't want um, religious conflicts, so she sent the Sadducees uh, to four to five towns outside of Jerusalem. She prevented the invasion of Tigranes, king of Armenia, by sending ambassadors and gifts to him when he was besieging Cleopatra Selene in Ptolemais. That's probably not the Cleopatra that you're thinking of. That title, that was more like a title, um, like Pharaoh. The time period of her rule was considered a golden age. The writers, when they write about this time period, they talk about lentils as big as denarii, and they had, you know, it only rained on Friday nights so that all the workers could work all week long, and then the rain would come. It was like just a huge harvest, prosperous times. Um, as she approached her death, her son Aristobulus began to seize control of the military uh, powers started to uh, realize that she was in danger of a coup. Her son was rising up. So she imprisoned her son's family uh, in Jerusalem, and then she died. Uh, the brothers continued to fight for power, um, and they couldn't figure out who was going to take over. Um, and so they asked the, some Roman people to come help them settle their dispute. Um, and instead, the Romans decided they wanted to take over. Um, and that they would let them be vassal kings uh, if they were loyal to Rome. So Salome was the last independent monarch of uh, this intertestamental period. Um, and after studying her life, I was not surprised to find out that Dr. Palmer had named his daughter Salome. Um, his wife is Greek, and so that was a wonderful Greek name that would be able to be that. But I was really, uh, I just learned quite a bit from studying her life and um, understanding more about the dynamics of how, I mean, I, I, I'd heard of Hanukkah, you know, but I didn't know where that fit in in the story. So it's really fascinating to see how God protected his people, how God provided for his people. And for me, a personal encouragement was that he used this woman to be able to um, rule successfully in Judah. So the brothers were fighting over power. Uh, Pompey besieges Jerusalem, um, many in 63 BC. Many of the priests are faithfully serving, sac doing their sacrifices even during the siege. Um, they are slain in the temple. Uh, thousands of Jewish people are killed. Pompey desecrates the temple. He enters the Holy of Holies. He sees the golden lampstand, the table, the spices, the offerings. But he's puzzled because there's no, there's no idol. There's no statue to worship. He doesn't even know who are these people worshiping. Um, so if you remember from Daniel, that fourth kingdom is brittle. Um, this Roman rule is now established in, um, in Jerusalem, in Judah. Um, and it's, it, it's very brittle. It's not, uh, it doesn't, 
there's always people fighting over power. So uh, Julius Caesar transforms the Roman Republic into an empire, and he is named the dictator. And Julius Caesar actually accomplished quite a bit um, during that time period uh, there. He instituted the Julian calendar that we still use today. Um, not too long afterwards, he is uh, assassinated and this starts a civil war for power in the Roman Empire. Um, an interesting thing to note about that time period is that during some games that are held in Julius Caesar's honor, there's a comet that appears in the sky for seven days. Uh, the people interpret that as Julius is taking his place among the gods, uh, and so he is the first Roman ruler to be honored this way as a deity, and that marks the beginning of the imperial cult, worshiping their ruler as a god. Julius has an adopted son. We know him as Caesar Augustus. It's also Octavius. Um, and Caesar Augustus becomes the first emperor of Rome. The Senate honors him with the title of Augustus, which means exalted one. He is given a, well, his official title was Emperor Caesar, son of the divine one, exalted. He is given a laurel crown, and that identifies him as Rome's savior. He's given an inscribed shield uh, that pronounces his virtues as one who would bring Roman peace, the Pax Romana, to the entire world. Does that all sound familiar to you? Son of God, uh, divine a savior bringing peace to the whole world. These things are reflective of the expectations that uh, the Hebrew people had for their Messiah. And these things were in the, in the culture, they also were understanding some of these things and inherently wanting a savior um, to come and bring peace. So we can see that not only are the expectations of the Israelites heightened during this time, but there's also fake versions of the Messiah that people are looking up to. We heard last week about Antichius IV, who styled himself as God manifest. Uh, and then next up, we hear about Herod, who is appointed as king of the Jews. Uh, so king of the Jews, God manifest, all these things were uh, imposters to the one true king who was coming to bring a true peace, not just for Rome, but for the entire world. So at this point in our history, Herod is um, king of the Jews, and he founds uh, Caesarea and, the, and builds, starts doing a ton of building projects. He is renovating the Jew Jerusalem temple. Um, he is going all out to show his loyalty to Caesar. Um, he's also a very jealous and paranoid king. Uh, he kills his wife and their two sons, uh, and then another son just five days before he himself dies in 4 BC. So this is Herod that we hear about that finds out that there is a prophecy of a king of the Jews somewhere. And so if we know he's willing to kill his whole family to maintain his rule, it's not a surprise that then he just goes out and has all the baby boys under two killed in that area. Uh, he is really paranoid and wants to protect his reign. But we see, ultimately, he dies and uh, is not reigning. Uh, so this is where we end our historical walk through the, um, the intertestamental period. This brings us up to 6 BC. Um, and next week, we find out more about what happens at that point. But to go over in the timeline... On the very bottom, there is a um, part right here that has the 10 expectations. Some of these will be very familiar because some of them were, are extensions of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, of the Mosaic covenant, of the Davidic covenant. A lot of these things are things they were saw that had been promised but had not actually come into um, actuality yet. 
So the first expectation, we, you know, now we see that the fourth kingdom, the Roman rule, has been established. So now as they look back at their prophets, they see one, two, three, four, all these kingdoms have come. Now it's time for the, hewn sto the unhewn stone to come in and inaugurate the kingdom. Uh, they have been sustained through adversity, um, and they've been searching the scriptures and looking for hope and also waiting for a second exodus. They were wanting to be freed, to be part of um, God's kingdom. So these are the 10 um, Old Testament promises that they would be expecting. First of all, they were expecting the kingdom of God to come and uh, as the reign of God on earth, that blue crown, we've seen that theme throughout the whole time. Um, one of the verses for this time period was, is Zechariah 14, 9. It says, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So they were expecting a time where the Lord would reign and he would be, and all the people would worship the Lord alone. This verse held a special place in Israel's liturgical life. It was the end of a prayer that was said three times a day. So a thousand times a year, they recited this. You know, we are now taking communion every week and we're remembering things and we're, we're having these practices that help us understand. This would have been a promise they repeated three times a day. So it's very much on their hearts to see how um, God is going to reign over his people forever. Um, and they were looking forward to the day that all the people would worship God alone. The second expectation is the royal son of man. Um, verses 13 and 14 in Daniel 7 say, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and, a, and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So they were waiting for this son of man to come. And we saw these uh, four kingdoms. They were described as uh, different beasts. And so yet they were waiting for a son of man to come and reign. So that's a contrast with these beastly characters that is contrasted with this humanity of a, of a new man, of a son of man, um, a second Adam. They were waiting for this um, one to come and be the royal son of man. The third expectation was also that the son of David would be, would be restored to the throne. God had promised David would have an heir, um, an eternal heir to the throne. Uh, the promise is stated again in Jeremiah 23, uh, 5 and 6. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. In that day, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. So they were waiting for the son of David to be restored to the throne. They were also uh, waiting for atonement of sin because... Um, we know that they could not live up to the commands of the Mosaic Covenant. Part of that time period and the, the bringing about the Mosaic Covenant was to show them of their inability to do that and the necessity for the atonement for their sin, to sh reveal the sin to them as well as show them a need for that to be atoned for. So Adam's sin had him exiled from the garden and Israel's sin had had them exiled from the promised land. The prophets longed to see a day when the full atonement would be made. And this long is, is expressed by Isaiah in chapter 53. Uh, verse six says, we all like sheep have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that whole chapter is a beautiful chapter on the suffering servant. Um, and so they were looking forward to this atonement of sin, um, and Christ's life would be like the Passover lamb the Passover lamb that inaugurated that first exodus. Um, and so Christ's sacrifice would be inaugurating that second exodus. The fifth aspect of hope Israel has is the expectation of a new covenant. So they had received the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, um, and they could not fulfill their part of that, um, which became very evident um, at, as God's promises to bless them were fulfilled when they obeyed and his promises to um, have the covenant curses on them were fulfilled. Uh, and so that their um, God's wrath on judging them rightly uh, to fulfill those promises ended in their exile. But they look forward to the hope of a new covenant um, in, let's see, this is Jeremiah 31, 31. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with my people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instruction deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So you see um, the icon for this promise of a new covenant is the picture of a heart with the tablets of the law. So how God is writing his law on the hearts of his people. I don't know about you guys, but I get really frustrated when I just keep on doing wrong things. Um, and so I imagine the people of Israel just look back and they're just like, man, we just cannot get it together. I can't wait until this new covenant is inaugurated when our, the law will be on our hearts. So the new covenant addresses this heart problem that Israel said, had, and it anticipates the work that is done through his spirit. So the sixth aspect is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So, so they had heard about how the Holy Spirit would be poured out, and these verses um, in the prophets would have encouraged them um, Ezekiel 36, 25 and 27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you or, and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. The seventh aspect is that blessing of Abraham. And you can see that we go back to the little present box that was part of the A in the casket um, icon. This was how the Lord promised to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham and his seed. And as we move to the next section, Messiah, we're going to see that the Lord is drawing people from all nations to himself. We're going to find that magi come from a distant land to bring gifts of worship to a child born in Bethlehem. So this is happening. Uh, this blessing of Abraham has already begun, even as we saw how the, the Hebrew scriptures had been translated into Greek to allow the people in that area to have access to God's word. Uh, the eighth aspect of the hope of Israel is the resurrection of the dead. They had heard, and these are some verses that talk about um, the uh, resurrection of the dead. And as we will see, uh, Christ's death is the first of that. Uh, we will find that this promise is fulfilled first in the Messiah being raised from the dead, and he bears humanity's sin as the suffering servant, but then he's raised as Israel's everlasting king. The ninth uh, promise, uh, the hope of the expectations, is the final judgment of the world and evil. 
So Israel saw the Lord as a mighty warrior, bringing righteous judgment on the earth. They were waiting for him to solve that problem of evil, both in themselves and in the world around them. Psalm 96 says, 11 through 13, says, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it, let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. So the coming judgment was an encouragement to them. Uh, the Lord brings payment for his enemies and uh, salvation for the redeemed. The tenth and final aspect of Israel's hope of the new creation um, is a new creation of heavens and earth. Uh, sin had corrupted God's very good creation, and humanity um, had corrupted his image. His image had been defaced um, uh, by sin. So this is expressed in Isaiah 65, verses 17 and 19, through 19. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad and rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. So the curse of Genesis 3 is overturned and a new heavens and earth will be a sanctuary of worship for all the, the redeemed of all the nations. And all of this is accomplished in Jesus Christ. So that is the period of expectations. Um, for me, looking closer at this time period helped me to understand and appreciate both the Old Testament and the New Testament in new ways. I'm having to eat my words about not liking history, um, having to find out that actually there's a lot that's interesting, um, and it's bringing some of these things to life for me that um, I had not seen before. Uh, and I hope that you are finding some of these things very interesting as well. There were three things in particular that I learned about the New Test, uh, the intertestamental period that helped my understanding. Uh, the first is that these were real people. They were living throughout this story. Uh, they were serving God and waiting for Messiah to come. Uh, they made mistakes. They studied um, the word and looked for the promises, they awaited the promises, and that's a real encouragement to me because we don't know when Christ is coming back, but we have these promises. We've seen how he has been faithful to fulfill all of these promises, and now we can know that the promises that we will see, some of these, um, some of these promises we won't see fulfilled till the yet to come time, and when we get to the end, uh, we will see that there is uh, there is a waiting of those things to be fulfilled. But um, these were real people, and I just really enjoyed seeing myself in them. Uh, I could see how, you know, I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to study the word, hold on to the hope that um, we have in the promises. And our lives may never end up in a history book, but we can see how these people in this time period were being used by the Lord. Um, and so our efforts to study the word and to serve the Lord are not in vain, and he uses it all. We saw how he just took the heart of the kings as uh, streams of water and was able to direct them however he wanted. So we know that that's happening now. We know that the Lord is in charge and he will do his will here today. So these things, looking at the history encourages me to look at the present in a new way. Secondly, the Pharisees get a really bad rap. Uh, the word Pharisee actually means set apart or separated. Uh, they wanted to separate themselves from the Greek culture. Uh, they wanted to um, be not like the, the uh, pagan people around them. They started off really trying to bring Jerusalem back to a better understanding, a true worship of God uh, found in his laws. Uh, part of the work that I had to do in the fall also was to read bits of the Mishnah and the Talmud. And so I was trying to read rabbinical arguments about if you needed to say a certain prayer, like, 
before you ate this, and well, you had to say the longer prayer if it had meat in it, or if it was just bread, you could say the short prayer, or but if there were olives, then you know you really needed to go all the way. It was a lot of like, you know, you could see where Jesus is like, you know, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you know, you're ignoring the weightier parts of the law. Um, but I do think the Pharisees, I think we really should identify more with the Pharisees when we read the New Testament. Uh, we really need to see that's, that's where we, that's where our hearts are. If we have grown up and understood God's laws and tried to understand, um, I'm just, I'm just not surprised now when I see that because I'm like, no, Jesus, this is how it is. This is what the word says. I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. I really need to, I need to take some steps back here. Uh, they really wanted to follow God's laws. Um, but their hearts were not humble to listen and be open to the spirit um, changing their, their understanding of what the word meant. Uh, the third is that I got a real sympathy for the disciples too. You know, as you looked at these physical kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greek, the Romans, all of these were physical kingdoms that were coming and the prophets talked about God's kingdom being inaugurated. And I just really understood why they were so confused um, upon Jesus's death and how, you know, they had a really big appreciate. I have a bigger appreciation of why they expected that. Uh, they knew that Jesus was the coming Messiah and he was the stone that was going to break down these kingdoms and the new kingdom was going to be inaugurated and they were ready for their administrative positions in the, the kingdom uh, of God. Uh, I gained a really wider sympathy for them um, and not only um, understanding what they must have felt, but just their grief, their disillusionment at Jesus' death, the depth of that. Like I have followed this person, like my whole life I've been waiting for Messiah. These last three years I've followed him and I don't understand. I just don't understand. Like, I, I just feel so much more sympathy for the disciples. And how could Rome have killed him? <laughs> how could they put him to death? How, how obviously he's not the Messiah, but just that disillusionment and, and fear and anger and sadness, all of that. I just, I really appreciated that more after studying and understanding the position that they were in. So... I have some questions for discussion for us all um, to think about uh, for this time period. A lot of history, a lot of kings and things, but um, some thoughts as you share with people in the group. Um, how did you see God working in the intertestamental period? Like what were some of the things that stood out to you either from this week or last week? Um, of the 10 expectations, which stood out to you and maybe connecting those back to some of the promises of the uh, Mosaic and Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. Um, and, as, and how does this period of expectations encourage you as we await Christ's second coming? So we will take some time and discuss those things and come back in a few minutes. Our Zoom friends are back with us, and uh, I hope you guys had some good discussion. Uh, I did want to pull out one point that I heard from the online group. Uh, they made mention of how this was an encouragement to humility as we think about our expectations of uh, the coming time um, and that we may uh, need to be humble as we wait uh, for Christ's second coming, um, to be aware and see how people had misunderstandings of those expectations, um, how that might apply to us and how we can be uh, faithfully humble um, and waiting for uh, Christ to come again. What did you guys think or questions that you had about this time period? Yeah. Yeah, the translation of the Septuagint was a huge turning point. Um, and it, it, as you look at this time period, the you can see how God was laying all these things out from the way uh, the Roman roads had been put into place, um, how those, it just really allowed uh, the gospel to be um, 
sent forth from that um, epicenter to allow those things to, but the Septuagint certainly. Um, I think an interesting, you know, debate we have over Bible translations nowadays, um, but, you know, we can see that they were probably just working with, you know, two, the, either the Hebrew translation or the Greek translation. Um, and so it'd be interesting to find out, you know, did Peter use the Septuagint or was he using the Hebrew Bible or what were he, you know, when they were quoting uh, the Bible and those things, I haven't looked that up yet, but I'm, I, that was one thing I thought about this week that I wanted to uh, consider. Other questions or thoughts? Mark, you mentioned at the end of Yeah, that pharisaical heart kind of lives in us. And I think that's what's so important as we study um, the Bible, as I'm, I'm in study in, I'm taking Theology 1 this semester. As we study God, we need to understand that we have to approach that with humility. We cannot, you know, come to the study of God thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be the one that gets it right. Like, it's really not about getting it right. It's about being humble. And obviously, we want to have a full understanding of the Lord. But the only way that we can have that is his grace to reveal it to us. Um, and so as we humbly come to the word, um, we allow it to change us. We allow the spirit to do the work in us instead of being prideful about, well, I've got it figured out. Um, we can be, you know, we don't want to be so open that our brain falls out. We can have convictions that are strongly held, um, but we need to hold them, you know, with open hands, allowing the Lord to change our hearts in those things. Questions, thoughts? <laughs> I mean, they started out with Yeah. And one of the things that I see as a parallel to us coming now, uh, and they measured that first two leaders now, they made it Well, and you see the, you were saying the Pharisees get a bad rap and the persecution that was endured. You see that persecution not only happens from the outside, but it happens from within. So like Nehemiah, his, you know, he was called to rebuild the walls, um, but there were Jewish people who were not for what he was doing. Um, and so we need to be aware that other Christians may disagree with us. Um, we can, uh, we're not a monolithic, you know, entity uh, that always is in perfect understanding, but can we, can we live together in humility, allowing other people have differences of opinions or doctrines or stances on things? Can we love each other? Because that's what, you know, the Pharisees were neglecting the weightier points of the law. They were doing the things right. On the outside, they looked holy, but on the inside, they were dead. And so we need to really examine our own hearts and not just look at other people's outside. We need to pray and ask the Lord to change our hearts, um, to remove that heart of stone and, and make us um, with a heart of flesh. Other thoughts? Yeah, Jay. Because I have to sort of in my own life try to sort out what self righteousness really is, just another way of talking about the Pharisees, mm -hmm. whether it's a genuine humble righteousness thing, as you speak in the real and heard the humility really cannot focus on the self righteousness. Yeah, yeah. And the, the posture that I want to hold is when I see things through, not the way they ought to be, is a posture not of standing back. Mm -hmm. I think that if we do this in church, to go that way to 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So self-righteousness and humility, not being able to coexist is the comment. And just as we live and encounter people with differences of opinion or things that we hold strongly, instead to come at that as a um, in love and in charity towards other. And, and Kevin and I were talking a little bit when we were uh, talking about the Pharisees, he's like, you know, they really, they, they did have a bad rap because there were some really problematic things. And I said, yeah, but you know, when you know their backstory, you understand it more. So like, if you've ever, you know, had a character in a movie, you find out, well, that's why they're so da, 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 you know, we have to understand the people around us also have backstories. Um, and that impacts the way that we think and the way that we think about others. And so as we think about the backstory of the Pharisees, it helps us to understand where they were. Now, do they need to change and be, you know, yes, they do. Um, but their the initial desire was to follow God, but that was corrupted into following the rules instead of um, following the spirit. So Anything else? Was this side of the room not chatty today? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and somebody online was talking about that same thing, just that, that they were really looking for that deliverance um, and how that changes our um, understanding of the times that we're going through as well. Um, that, you know, would we want to be under Roman rule right now? Or, you know, do we, are we okay with a democracy? You know, even if it's not exactly the way we want it, would we rather put ourselves in that place? Um, so, you know, they had real weighty expectations, that desire for deliverance was um, they were they were oppressed peoples um, in that time period. They did not uh, they were taken advantage of, and they were um, they were not they were seeking the deliverance from the Lord. And we, we it's hard for us to understand that, um, but if we can put ourselves in that place, we can see how the wrath of God is actually a beautiful and wonderful thing, not only to cleanse us from our sins, but also to cleanse the world and make things the way they should be. All right, anything else for today? Oh, Zoom, okay, let me, I can check that, I think. Friends, it might have been. Oh, Eric says, our group observed that all the expectations can be found in Jesus' teaching. Yes, that was something I remember hearing. He announced that the kingdom of God is at hand and also each of the other things. So we saw that Jesus was talking about these expectations. So to the people would have been able to see how, and one of his favorite titles for himself is Son of Man. Um, and so he was not just saying that like, I am a son of man, but that, you know, this was part of the expectation. Yeah, Rob. It's like the power that Jesus came with was greater than just kings of the earth. It's, it's not that he didn't have the power to take away those kingdoms or to, you know, he could call down 10,000 soldiers to come and, you know, angel armies to, to inaugurate his kingdom. But that wasn't what it was about. And so I think at the resurrection, as these expectations are translated and understood to under to uh, just the, the amazement that the disciples must have felt when they realized, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. It is a, a renewing of our hearts. We're free from sin and the spirit dwelling in us is here. Like these promises are true 
And now we just have to understand them in light of Christ's death and resurrection instead of, oh, we're going to conquer the Romans. Well, very good uh, time for today. I hope you guys uh, learned some new stuff and uh, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the blessing of um, being able to look back at the history um, in the intertestamental period. God, we are um, encouraged to do like the people at that time, to study the word, to keep our hope in you, to remain humble and open to uh, your spirit's work in our lives. So we pray that you would do that in our hearts, that you would open our minds to see the wonderful things in your law, to illuminate our hearts, uh, to hear from you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us and for uh, your word. Thank you for the blessing of being able to share today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.